Let me read for you this chapter, and then we'll see what might God have for us from these scriptures today. This is Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. I also saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. Then I heard a loud voice from the throne, Look! God's dwelling is with humanity, and he will live with them. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Grief, crying, and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away. Then the one seated on the throne said, Look, I'm making everything new. He also said, Right, because these words are faithful and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will freely give to the thirsty from the spring of the water of life. The one who conquers will inherit these things, and I'll be his God, and he'll be my son. But the cowards, faithless, detestable murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their share will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Then one of the seven angels, who had held the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues, came and spoke with me. Come, I'll show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. He then carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, arrayed with God's glory. Her radiance was like a precious jewel, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. The city had a massive high wall with 12 gates. 12 angels were at the gates. The names of the 12 tribes of Israel's sons were inscribed on the gates. There were three gates on the east, three on the, on the north, three on the south, and three gates on the west. The city had 12 foundations, and the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb were on the foundations. The one who spoke with me had a golden measuring rod to measure the city, its gates, and its wall. The city is laid out in a square. Its length and width are the same. He measured the city with the rod at 12,000 stadia. That's about 22,000 kilometers, just for reference. Its width, length, and height are equal. Then he measured its wall, 144 cubits, according to human measurements, which, which the angels used. The booting material of its walls was jasper, and the city was pure gold, clear as glass. The foundations of the city wall were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first foundation is jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrys... Chrysophrase, the 11th jacinth, the 12th amethyst. The 12 gates are 12 pearls. Each individual gate was made of a single pearl. The main street of the city was pure gold, transparent as glass. I didn't see a temple in it because the Lord God, the Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or moon to shine on it because the glory of God illuminates it. And its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. The gates will never close by day because it will never be night there. They will bring the glory and honour of the nations into it. Nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those written in the Lamb's book of life. Then he showed me the river of the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the city's main street. The tree of life was on each side of the river, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, producing its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations and there will no longer be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be there in the city and his servants will worship him. They'll see his face and his name will appear on their foreheads. Night will be no more. People will not need the light of a lamp nor the light of the sun because the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. All right, pretty fantastical passage of scripture. Let's pray and ask God to help us understand it. Father, again, we need your help. We need your help to understand uh, what you would reveal to us from the scriptures today. So keep us attentive to your spirit, hearts and minds inclined towards you as you speak to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. So again, the letter of revealing Jesus, not some abstract Prophecy just about end times, written, but rather a letter written to a group of people to reveal to them the state of the world in their day, 
and it is for us so that we would understand how God is at work even in our day. So we're not trying to draw lines from Revelation to current events to say, okay, here is where we are in the, chronolo- in the chronology of the last, last days, but to actually zoom out over the last 2,000 years and thousands of years before to see how has God been at work in the world, in all of creation? How has God been specifically at work in and through his people over time? And how does that both foreshadow and reverberate throughout history so that we can live today with great confidence, knowing how God is at work today and knowing what, how he's going to uh, finalise his work in the future. So it's not all about the future. It's about how we live today in light of what he's done in the past, in light of what he's doing today, and in light of the promises for the future. That's how we're going to read Revelation. And we've seen over and over and over again these types. So you might remember, if you've been around City Light for a while, a few years ago we did a series over a couple of months in the lead up to Christmas called The Royal Line. As we looked from Adam through the Old Testament at these types of Christ, how God was promising, how God was foreshadowing this Jesus, the Messiah, the chosen one, in fact, God himself, who was going to come. And we saw in Adam and in Moses and even in the Ark of Noah, uh, in the serpent that was held up, um, the bronze serpent held up in the wilderness, we saw these types of the one who was to come fulfilled in Jesus. And as we read Revelation, what we're seeing is John, the author of Revelation, is seeing these visions given him from Jesus to reveal to him and for us how God has been at work from the very beginning. And we see these types of Babylon or city set against God or of of types of this beast who's set against God. We see types of um, the heavenly city. And now we see, finally, the promise or the fulfillment of all of these types, all of these reverberations, all of this foreshadowing, all of these kind of echoes through history and through scripture of the city that's going to come. We saw the city Babylon yesterday. In that city, there's no more laughter, no sound of joy, no one getting married because it's completely dealt with. It's dust, destroyed. And the contrast is this week, it's the new heavenly city. And so we've got this, um, we've got this saying, you might have heard it, all good things must come to an end. But as we read Revelation 21 and into 22, what we see is actually not all good things come to an end. There, there are some good things that actually go on forever and ever, and we're invited to come and participate in that goodness. In fact, it's the opposite of all good things must come to an end. Everything that's not good has come to an end. It's actually the exact inversion of our saying all good things come to an end. Only good things remain in the new city. It's an amazing, phenomenal promise. What we've seen so far about this picture of heaven is it is full of glory. We see a throne surrounded by, again, majestic fantastical living creatures surrounded by other thrones and the elders on these thrones lay down their crowns and worship the one who is on the throne. And around those thrones, we see the whole host of the angels of heaven worshiping Jesus. And around them, we see the whole host of all of God's people for all time worshiping God in in joy. And that's the picture of heaven we see up till Revelation 21. And then that heaven's gone. And John sees at the beginning a new heaven and a new earth and descending out of the new heaven is this new city. And he tells us about the city. Now, if this is your first week here, uh, what we've learned about Revelation is there are things in Revelation like numbers, um, uh, like we've seen the number 1,000, the number 7, the number 3 and 4 and a few other numbers that are signs that point to something significant. And so as we're reading, uh, you might have heard there's 12 foundations. And there are 
uh, three gates on either side of the city, and each gate is a pearl. Um, and so there's 12 gates and 12 foundations, and the city is t- 22,000 kilometers wide and 22,000 kilometers long and somehow 22,000 kilometers high. And we start to realize, uh, actually, this is, these are not architectural plans for the new city. These are signs that tell us significant things about the city. So what I want to do is go, okay, so let's, let's uh, get at the measuring rod and this is how this is what these things are and this is what these things are and there's 12 foundations for some reason and there's names on each of the 12 foundations and uh, there are different um, uh, emeralds or precious stones representing each of those and that's literally what it's going to look like in the future but rather it's telling us truths about the new creation. What does it tell us about the new creation? What does it tell us about the new city? What we see here is echoes of the garden back in Genesis. What we're hearing is if you're familiar, like we've been seeing over the last couple of weeks, if you're familiar with the prophecies in Zechariah and Ezekiel, the things that we're hearing in Revelation 21 about the new city will sound very familiar to you. So we'll look at some of those as well. So like in the, in the beginning of the Bible, we see a new creation. In, the Genesis, in, in Revelation 21, we see a new creation. Back in the beginning, we have a marriage In the new beginning, we have a marriage. In the first beginning, uh, we have God walking with his people in the call of the night. In the new creation, we have God walking with his people. In In the first beginning, we have a light for the day and a light for the night. In the new creation, we have a light for the day and a light for the night. In the Eden, we have a river running through. In the new city, the new Jerusalem, we have a river running through. In the beginning, we have the tree of life giving immortality. In the new creation, in the new city, we have the tree of life giving immortality. We've mentioned before a bunch of times, in the beginning, Eden was flawless but not perfect. No sin, no flaws, but God said, you've got work to do. I want you to make it better. I want you to work the land. I want you to spread the image of God across all of the world. And so although it was flawless and there was no sin, it wasn't yet perfect. And in the new creation, we will also have work to do. It will be flawless. It will be without sin. And we will have glorious and wonderful work to do. In the first garden, there was no sin. And God said, only, only trust in me. That was the one requirement to have access to the tree of life and immortality. Just trust in me. Don't eat from the other fruit and take your life's governance into your own hands. Trust me, is is the call from God. Believe me, listen to me. Have the same mind as my mind. And we see in in Genesis 3, our first parents did not do that. Rather, they said, no, I'm going to take governance, my life, into my own hands. And God cursed the ground. But in the new creation, we see the curse is not just lifted, but reversed. In the garden comes a promise that the seed of the woman will crush evil, crush evil the head of the serpent. And now in the new city, no evil can even enter because it is done and the serpent has been crushed. This is what it says. Then the one seated on the throne said, look, I'm making everything new. He also said, right, because these words are faithful and true. He said to me, it is done. It is done. We've heard these words a bunch of times, right? On the cross, it is done. At the destruction of Babylon, we saw the last, last week and earlier in Revelation, it is done. And we hear again, it is done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will freely give to the thirsty from the spring of the water of life. God doesn't take us out of this world into some immaterial heaven forever. If your idea of heaven is like spirits, uh, maybe with a halo, maybe you get wings when you go to heaven. 
uh, playing harps, lounging on clouds. That's not how the Bible talks about eternity. We get that from cartoons, not from scripture. We get that from pop culture, not from God. That's not how you're going to spend eternity. That sounds like a fun for a couple of days, like a good weekend, and really boring for forever. That's not our life. He makes the world into what he wanted the world to be like from the start. He doesn't say, I'm making all new things. He says, I'm making all things new. This is why we see these bookends of creation in Genesis and Revelation, the new creation in Revelation, the revealing. He's not, he's not saying, well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm done. He's saying, let's make it awesome. Let's undo everything that has gone wrong, making all things new. What other features do we see in the new city, in the new creation? There's no more sea. So the sea that made, uh, like separated nations. And the sea in the Old Testament in particular is this, um, denotes chaos, uh, denotes like a decreation. In fact, even if you see, do you remember, in Genesis 1, verse 2, the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters of the deep. And so we see the sea, even in the very beginning, denoting chaos, and God creates order out of chaos. And we see when he makes the new creation, there's no more sea because there's no more chaos. He's made all things new. It's amazing. There's, there are trees of life, or the tree of life is on either side, uh, producing 12 fruits whose leaves are for the healing of the nation. If you're familiar with Ezekiel's prophecy, we went into Ezekiel last week as well. Uh, Lots of echoes of Ezekiel in Revelation. You'll see in Ezekiel, there's this river with a tree of life on both sides, whose leaves are for the healing of the nations. We see this promised even hundreds of years before John sees it and writes it down to the seven churches in Asia Minor. He says, yeah, you know know what's been promised before? That's still coming. God will fulfill his promises. And what does Ezekiel say about the city? He says, the city is called Yahweh Shema. God is there. Yahweh's there. That's the name of the city. Yahweh's there. What else about the new city tells us that Yahweh's there? I mean, explicitly, John says, Yahweh's there. But the city's a cube, right? So from here to Perth is about, you know, a direct line is about 2,200 kilometers, and that is about 12,000 stadia. So this city that John sees is this gargantuan city. I don't know why the city has a wall, even, if the city is 22,000 kilometers tall. Uh, why is it denoted? Why, why is it? Jesus showed John a cube for the city. Well, remember again, this is an apocalyptic symbol. It's a revealing symbol showing us something, not architectural plans of the new city telling us what the city looks like and how you're going to walk around or navigate the city. It's not what it's telling us. It's telling us that the only other cube we see in Scripture is the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle and the Holy of Holies in the temple. It's where God lives, is the cube. And so when John sees, actually the whole city is where God dwells. He's not constrained or doesn't constrain himself to just this little cube in the Holy of Holies that only one person, one time a year can go in to make sacrifices on behalf of all of the people. That one representative going into the place with God, no, no, it has become expansive. There's room for everybody there because our one greater and true representative in Jesus has made the one time for all time sacrifice so that we could go there and be with God. Yahweh Shema is the name of the city. The Holy of Holies has expanded from a room to half a continent. 
and God lives there with his people. In fact, John tells us, they will be his people and God himself will be with them and will be their God and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Grief, crying and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away. Imagine just the grief and pain in your own life. I know some of you have had very hard years. Some of you had very hard weeks. People among us who've had close relatives die this week, who've had bad diagnoses confirmed this week, let alone over your whole life, let alone just the room this size. Imagine all, all of the grief and loss and pain just in a room this size. Um, you know, the grief of strained or broken relationships or uh, lost loved ones, lost children, disappointment of missed opportunities, uh, things you wish you hadn't done or things you missed out on or wish you had done, the, the tears of frustration at injustice that you just can't overcome or a wrong that just can't be righted, uh, you know, in the now. What it says of the new city is, None of these things will be in the new city. None of those things will be in the new city. The curse is reversed. In Zechariah's prophecy, it says, the streets will be filled with the sound of children playing there. And the last week, there is no sound in the other city. Just dust. But in the new creation, in the new city, there is just the sound of joy everywhere. In the city of the land, the kids' laughter fills the streets. You might be like me, looking forward to meeting children you haven't met who died in the womb, laughing together in the streets of the new creation. Can't wait. Because no more tears, no more grief, no more pain, no more death. Even death has been dealt with. We saw this last week. Even death has been thrown into the lake of fire. Even death is dust and no more. But best of all, best of all, you know what makes me suspicious about every book or movie written about someone who dies and goes to heaven and comes back? You know, the stories are filled with, wow, it's the, top, like the landscape is amazing and my my long-lost brother or relative was there, and it was phenomenal. Uh, but the most phenomenal part about the new creation is that we will see Jesus. Throughout Scripture, uh, the, the highlight of heaven, the highlight of the new creation, which is where we're going to live, the new earth, in the new city, is that Jesus is there. And we get to see his face. So we're not just proximate, we are intimate. It's glorious because God's there. It says, The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. Night will be no more. People will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun because the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. Even in Scripture, the most powerful, most glorious creatures, the seraphim around the throne, they have little wings around their face to, to cover their eyes from the glory of God. We read in Scripture where God shows his glory to people. He says, uh, don't look, I'm just going to pass you by. And as I pass by, then just, you know, through the cracks of your fingers, just have a look at my back. You'll see my glory pass by. Or Isaiah goes to the throne room, but does he look upon God? No, he just sees the smoke that fills the temple and the train of his robe. Because the overwhelming glory of God is too much for mere creatures to handle. But? In the new creation, in the new creation, we see him. Not because his glory is in any sense diminished, 
but because he glorifies us. He doesn't diminish himself like he did when he condescended to become a human like us. He elevates us to communion with him. He glorifies us. We see his face. It says, the Lord will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. Not just Jesus reigns forever and ever. He brings us up to him and, and we will reign with him forever and ever. What, what amazing glory. This is a difficult thing for us to receive, like difficult thing for us to accept because we know our lowliness, we know our squishiness, we know our sinfulness, we know we don't deserve this. This is the wonder and the glory of the gospel. This is why, this is one of the reasons that we can confidently say, we don't have to, we don't have, to have a false humility and say, well, yeah, I hope I get into heaven. I hope I, like, I hope I scrape in. That's actually, that is born from the false gospel of good works, of self-righteousness, that I could myself work my way into heaven. Well, I hope I can climb that moral threshold and just sneak in. That's the anti-gospel the gospel is a not an arrogant but a confident, yes, I'm confident of being there on that day, precisely not because of my good works, but because of the finished work of Jesus, because of his righteousness imputed to me, because he has taken and borne all of my sin, taken all of my shame, every stain upon himself on the cross and gifted me the clothing of righteousness. So when we say, yeah, I am confident of spending eternity with God, that's not arrogance because we're not placing our faith in our good works quite the opposite. We're saying, yeah, I'm confident that Jesus' work is enough. Imputed on my account. Gifted to me. Not because I'm awesome, but because he's awesome. That I will reign with him in glory. (laughs) Not because I'm awesome, but because he has saved me and invited me not just into his kingdom, not just into his family, but into union with him. This is, one of the most, this is why I love weddings, actually. We saw a wedding in the first beginning and a wedding in the new beginning, where the two become one. And Paul says, this is a mystery, and I tell you, it is representative of Christ and his church. It's why we are called his bride. And we are united with him. We become one with him. Scripture talks about being hidden in him. That's how intimate, how close we are. We are hid in him. It's wonderful. It's amazing. It's like that forever. What's not in the new city? No sin. No death. No grief. No pain. I'm not sure if that's no physical pain or no pain of loss because we're still going to have work to do, still going to have things to explore, still going to have things to like, grow in. It's going to be wonderful. We don't become omniscient when we uh, are, are in a resurrected body. It's only God is omniscient, om- all-knowing, that is. It's an incommunicable characteristic of God. He can't gift that to somebody else. We'll have wonders to wonder in things to learn, people to meet. It's going to be wonderful. What else isn't in the new city? Uh, This is what John says. The one who conquers will inherit these things. And I will be his God. He will be my son. Doesn't exclude daughters. He's saying he'll be my son in terms of sharing in the inheritance. So we're all sons and we're all the bride. But the cowards, faithless, detestable murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their share will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. And later he says, nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, only those written in the Lamb's book of life. So there are two streams, actually, in the new earth. Both streams come from God. The one stream is a stream of life, The other is the stream of fire. 
We see his mercy and his judgment. The river of life leading to immortality. The stream of fire or the lake of fire leading to death, the second death. All those in the Lamb's book of life, all those who have trusted in God and his finished work, all of those share in the river of life. And all those who haven't trusted in Jesus are justly judged on their own works in the end. I'm not saying there's going to be a literal lake of fire. Uh, again, these are symbols or signs that point to something significant. It says, what is that fire? The, 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 what is this sign? It's the second death. That, that is the end for those who don't trust in Jesus. What is the end for those who do trust in Jesus? It is eternal life with God. What is the most important thing? It is that we'll be with God, we'll see his face, rule and reign with him forever. We don't trust in Jesus because, again, because we're awesome. Don't trust in Jesus because we've got it all figured out. Don't trust in Jesus because we went and got our lives in order, came back and presented them to Jesus. Well, here, I'm, I'm good now. I don't know. It, we trust in the finished work of Jesus. And so, as we've seen uh, along the way through this letter of Revelation, uh, both of these streams come from God himself, justice and mercy. So for us, we have the same, we have the same choice, if you like, as even Adam and Eve in the beginning. Are we going to trust in God or are we going to eat the fruit of our own self-governance? So now, do we want to be judged on Christ's finished work or on our own righteousness? The good news is we don't have to be judged on our own righteousness, our own merits. When Jesus says, repent and believe, when the apostles say, repent and believe, when the scriptures say, repent and believe, what they're saying is, repenting is turning away from your old way of life. Stop trying to reach up to God. Stop trying to live your own way. Stop trying to sit on the throne of your own life, determine what is good and what is not according to your own wisdom, but rather gain the mind of Christ. Think like God thinks. Come under his lordship. And believe means to just acknowledge that what Jesus has done is all that is necessary. So again, we don't arrogantly, but we boldly say, yes, I, I, will, I am clothed in righteousness. I am presently a new creation. I can say that confidently, confidently not because I'm awesome, but because he's awesome. I can say I will see his face and he will wipe away every tear from my eye. Not because I'm awesome, but because he's awesome. It's not an arrogant claim. The arrogant claim is, yeah, I'm just going to sneak into heaven because I'm saying I can produce good works on my behalf. No, we abandon our own good works. We throw ourselves on the mercy of God and he loves to lavish us with his mercy. That's what's a stream of life coming from his throne. Folks, we're invited to the new city. We don't have to go to the other city. We're invited to the new city. How does this help us now? Remember, Revelation, not just a, an abstract book telling us about end times. How does this help us today? Well, remember the people it was written to are the ones being brutalized, the ones being persecuted, the ones being chased down by Roman authorities and killed, dipped in oil and lit on fire to be lamps on the way to games. This is Jesus revealing to them uh, every injustice that we've made right. All evil will be crushed. There's going to be none of that in the new city because God is there. So you can do it. You can live today in light of God's righteous rule and reign in your life, knowing that even if it costs us our life, we get to rule and reign with him for forever. In fact, it says forever and ever, just in case the forever isn't long enough, forever and ever. It's wonderful. You, and you can do it. You can reject the temptations of the world to live life your own way according to your own wisdom. You can reject the lies of the deceiver and say, I, 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 reject, I don't believe that. I'm listening to Jesus. 
you can withstand um, or live through the persecutions. Uh, and man, when I say that, I hesitate to say that from, a, uh, from an Australian perspective tonight at Glenelg. We've got someone from International Justice Mission coming to speak about some of the ways that people are suffering around the world. And it's not a competition. But there are people who hear these things and hear about the justice of God and celebrate. And we should too. And he says, you can, you can trust in God even if it costs you your life. Because though you die, we live in the promise that even death is thrown into the lake of fire. So there's no more death. We live and reign with him forever. It's wonderful. So we can encourage one another to this end. We can point each other to scripture in this end. We can sing to one another, encouraging hymns and psalms and spiritual songs to this end. And we can pray and ask God to help us to this end. Uh, but man, we need to be, what helps us today is living in light of tomorrow. Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you for these scriptures. Thank you that you have loved us so greatly that even though we rebelled against you in your creation, uh, you have made us a new creation. We ruined the garden. You've prepared for us a city. Though we reached for the fruit of our own self-governance, you have prepared a place where the tree of life is in abundance. Where death and grief and tears are no more but joy and laughter and intimacy and togetherness is there forever. Where there is no evil and the curse has been reversed. Father, I just want to praise you for your goodness and your kindness towards us. Thank you for the love which you have lavished upon us. Thank you for not treating us according to our works, but according to Christ's perfection. Thank you for calling us your sons and your daughters. Thank you for making us the bride for your son. And we look forward to that great wedding in the future when you make all things new. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.